for a message this morning, and I'm going to talk fast because I have 20 minutes, and I know you all have garbage to get to, but I'm going to ask, and I have my mind to watch for Picking and choosing 
our education, our house, our cars, our, our whatever. If we don't like something, they are not giving us what we want as a consumer. We simply go to another website, order it from someone else who can give us exactly what we want. We have grown accustomed to having the luxury of getting what we want when we want it. And while all this freedom is wonderful, and it's a luxury, and it's a blessing, and as the mother of a 22-year-old who about one month ago returned home from a nine-month tour of duty in Afghanistan, I share a deep and profound gratitude for the gift that so many others have given to each of us. But all this freedom has perhaps set us up for a great deception. We take freedom for granted. We take our choices for granted. But what happens when the choice is made for us? What happens when life chooses and we didn't get a vote? What happens when we hear the word cancer out of our doctor's mouth? What happens when a family is faced with a loss, unbelievable loss, of a child? There is no choice in that. What do we do in that place where we are not given a choice? And where is God in that place? See, we cannot enter the realm of the spiritual with a shopping bag mentality. We cannot come into that place of genuine spirituality where we come in contact with a Something that has the power to transform, not simply our thinking, but our souls, our hearts, at a profound level. We can't enter that place with our hands full of shopping bags and a mentality that says, I'm going to pick and choose. We cannot approach our Christianity with a soup du jour attitude. Well, you're serving this day, I don't like that, I'm going to go down the street to the next restaurant. There, because when life comes in, and hands us something that we have not been given the luxury of choosing. It is exactly that point where we need to know how to access something which is greater than our ability to choose. That's where the church comes in. We're talking about a place of soul and of spirituality. Recently, I read a post on Facebook it was a friend's response to the news that friends of hers had just lost their son to suicide. And there were lots of beautifully written condolences, lots of words, but her response stood out from all the others. It was the shortest. It was the briefest. It simply said this, no words, only tears. See, there is a suffering of soul and spirit that is too profound for words. It is a suffering which can only be met with tears. Because it calls us to witness a place of such dark torment that in the witnessing of it, our own soul is broken. With the enormity of that which we've not been asked to endure perhaps, but which we willingly bear witness of. Today, the sexual exploitation and the violence being directed towards women and girls is perhaps, and according to former President Jimmy Carter, it is in fact the greatest human rights abuse of our generation, of our culture. It confronts us with perhaps the greatest moral dilemma of our time. And the question that then remains for us is, but what can I do about it? What difference can I possibly make? That was a question that confronted me two years ago now, as I sat in my very comfortable living room, looking out over a beautiful mountain vista of Vermont, drinking my cup of coffee in my morning, Fuzzy pajamas, yes, if you come to my house in the morning, you'll see me in my morning. But you wear fuzzy pajamas in Vermont. I've learned that in three years. You wear them from like September until June. Um, and I was in my living room drinking a cup of coffee, reading online the New York Times, and I read an article by Nick Kristoff. Some of you know she's
sure I've heard that name, where he told a story that profoundly impacted me. And little did I know two years ago, that story was going to set me on a path of journey and sacrifice, and it was going to call me into a place of walking through the shadow of the valley. It was a story, a true story, of a young girl who was sold into sexual slavery by her uncle. And she was beaten, she was raped, and she was exploited for years and years and years. She went on to have two children, a son and a daughter, um, and she began to fight as a mom when she realized that her son and daughter were about to be used by the brothel. And it was at that point that this young girl who had been exploited at the age of 11, it was at that point when it was her son and her daughter that somehow she found the strength to begin to fight. And the end of the story, and I'm not going to skip through the details of this story, but the end of the story was that mom who'd been so betrayed and so exploited beat the odds. She beat the odds. And I won't go into all the details, but... But that story so haunted me, and so impacted me, and so jolted me out of my Western, comfortable mindset to think that this actually happens? In this day and age, this kind of horrific event happens? And my next thought was, well, but it happens in, happens over there. It happens in third world countries. Not that that made that any less impactful to me, but that was my mindset. And I started searching. I got on Google. And I started, I started searching on Google and recognized and realized quickly that sex trafficking is happening right here, right now. As we sit here this morning in communities less than half an hour from here, young girls are being trafficked. That's not sensationalistic whatever designed to make us all paranoid and send us out on these proverbial witch hunts. That's simply the reality. The perpetrators will have us believe a lot. The lie is, it's not happening in my community. It's not happening in my world. And, and the second lie is, if it's not happening to me, then I therefore have no obligation to get involved or to care. And yet, we are called to care. Our very humanity demands that we are called to care. When I first started, when I heard that story, my first thought was, or second thought after the, the trauma of the story was, what can I do? There's nothing I can possibly do. Sex trafficking is a $32 billion a year industry. It is second only to drug and, and arms trade globally. And it's quickly surpassing that because you can sell a girl a number of times. So the rate of return is better for a girl than for drugs or for illegal weapons. It is universal. It is here in the U.S. Uh, we, we were invited to go to a, a trafficking conference, anti-trafficking conference in Brunswick, Maine, not that long ago. And I did what I typically do when I'm invited. I Google in the place where I'm going. So I typed in Brunswick, Maine, sex trafficking, thinking, surely there's not going to be anything in Brunswick, Maine. And I pulled up within minutes a news story that had just broke that, that the day before, they had broken up two different sex trafficking rings 20 minutes from where we were going to be speaking, from where the conference was going to be happening. Go home and Google it. Type in your community. It's happened and happening here in Vermont. This is an issue that we have to struggle with today, that we have to deal with. But I'm not here to share with you a political message necessarily. I'm here to say to you and to share with you where do we go with this kind of terrorism and tragedy and what do we do with it? I have posted the hashtag bring back our girls on Facebook, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And, and I have some of my dance students in the city opposing with the bring back our girls hashtag and put it on Facebook. And, you know, I saw a lot of different conversations happening online. Some people were saying, well, you know, this is just a bunch of fluff and why bother? What difference does it make? You know, what's the point of this? You're not helping those girls. You're not. And I started thinking about that question. What difference does it make? When I sat in my living room two years ago, I almost did nothing. 
because I felt that anything that I had to offer or contribute would not make a difference. And that's one of the issues of technology today. Terrorism is imported into our cell phones, into our living rooms, in instant. And we have two, two ways to deal with it. We can simply become overwhelmed by it and traumatized and turn the channel or become completely numb to it. Or somehow, some way, we have to find the strength and the courage to engage with it and to say, what can I do to make a difference? My making a difference was to say, you know what, one of the things I do as a choreographer is create dances. And I thought, can I put this woman's story on stage? Because our stories are powerful. Your stories are powerful. I love to hear people's stories, the tragedy and the triumph, and to hear where is God in our stories. And, and here's, here's what I alluded to in the beginning of the message. Oftentimes, God is most visible in those places that are most broken. God is most visible in those places in our own lives of profound brokenness. And what I began to discover as I started researching and reading story after story after story from here in the U.S. to other countries of sex trafficking, and my, my heart and my soul were overcome, and I was having nightmares, and I was saying, God, I was going through anger and grief and being overwhelmed. And finally, I thought, I have to do something. And I, you know, I stopped. I, was, I woke up one morning. I was thinking about Harriet Beecher Stowe. And I didn't know why I was thinking about Harriet Beecher Stowe, and I kept like kind of dismissing it out of my mind while I was doing everything else I had to do. And it dawned on me why I was thinking about Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe, obviously, was a woman. She was born into a family of very famous preachers. She was academically and intellectually gifted. It is written that her father, a very famous preacher himself, said one, at one point in time, if only Harriet had been born a boy because he knew she would never be allowed to exercise her full giftings in that time and culture as a girl. But Harriet Beecher Stowe didn't let any of this stop her. She went on to tell a story. And when Abraham Lincoln met her, it said that he shook her hand and he said to her, because she was very tiny, you're the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. And all of a sudden, I knew why I was thinking about Harriet Beecher Stowe. I was thinking about Mary Beecher Stowe because here was a woman who didn't let obstacles get in her way. She did the one thing she could do. And the message to me was literally, do the one thing that you can do. And the rest, as I say, is history. I, you can read about Full Cry. We created a production based on this story. Um, and that has been a one-year journey for me. Um, that production was put on stage. I had a famous composer give us full permission to use uh, his music, a, a film composer. You hear his music in Harry Potter movies and a lot of movies you see in theater. I wrote to him and he gave us permission to use his music. A college gave us permission to come in and use their theater. A uh, city councilman was so moved by what he saw, he went on to go back to the city council and introduce anti-trafficking legislation, which has now been passed into law. He's now president of the city council. Um, the project itself has been written up in an academic book. I had no way of knowing, and I'm not saying that to do this at all. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm saying that to say that none of us know what a difference we can make in the world when we do the one thing it is that we are called to do. And you say, well, what am I called to do, Lord? What about these girls in Africa? And I want to share with you the what I call the so what factor. Romans, this selection, this ver these verses that were read, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. See, the other title for my message this morning was going to be Cry Like a Girl. Cry Like a Girl. When I was growing up, the worst insult you could give and I had two brothers who, you know, when we were little, we would get into wrestling matches the whole nine yards um, until they suddenly shot up to over six feet. And I decided it was in my best interest 
not to engage them. Uh, but, but the worst thing I could say to my brother was, you fight like a girl, and then I run, uh, because I knew it was coming. Or you cry like a girl. And I want to suggest to each of us this morning that sometimes the most profound thing that we can do is to cry like a girl. And so gentlemen, yeah, sometimes the most profound thing we can do is to cry like a girl. To refuse to allow the inundation of technology and day in and day out these reports of terrorism to just make us numb, but to go to that place, to walk into the shadow of the valley with someone else, to do what Elie Wiesel calls, we are called to bear witness. And as Christians, we are called to do more than simply stand on the sidelines offering our political solutions or our political analysis. There is a time and a place for politics, don't misunderstand me, but here in this place, we are called to something far more profound and far more transformative. We are called to open our hearts and our souls to both the pain and the brokenness and to find in that place of pain and brokenness a beauty and a compassion that has the power to transform. Regardless of a political outcome. I mean, when you read these words, avenge not yourselves, but give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And in verse 20, if your enemy hungers, feed him, if he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall keep coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. I don't know about you, but I struggle with blessing someone who's been mean to me. And I'm just going to be honest, okay? I, I have a, I, you know, I'm from Massachusetts, and I drive like I'm from Massachusetts. I have a hard time with that. I read those verses, and I say, God, how can I die? I know it sounds spiritual, and we can say, yes, we're called. But you know what? When someone cuts me off on 91, and my response is not, bless you, brother. I'll be honest. We're human, and our natural response is, is to enact vengeance to want to do something, to go to battle, to go to war. And in the case of these Nigerian girls, this is where we feel so helpless. This is where the point at which we feel so helpless, and this was the question that I was wrestling with, is how am I helping these girls by putting a hashtag sign on Facebook saying, bring back our girls. How is that helping them? And God, where are you in this? I have a former dance student. Her name is Jenna. And she graduated from high school, I think, college, and went on to work for an orphanage in, I believe it's Haiti. And so every morning when I get up, Jenna posts these adorable pictures of these children in Haiti that she is working with. Now, there's one in particular. She posted this picture one day of this little teeny tiny baby girl who looked like she was on death's door. She was on death's door. She was close to starving when she was brought and found and brought into the orphanage. And every day I would watch as Jenna would post pictures of this little girl. And one day Jenna put a post on Facebook of a young boy. He was, a, I believe, probably a 12 or 13 year old boy that she had befriended in the orphanage. And he had been tragically killed in a car accident. And I heard Jenna's heartbreak in her Facebook post as she talked about this 12-year-old boy. And having taught her as a dance student, I knew her soul and her spirit and, and the sensitiveness that she brought to this work. And I heard her questioning God in those posts. Why God? It's a question we all ask. That's where our freedom to choose, that's where the great deception comes in. Because there are times when we are not allowed the freedom to choose. And where is God? Where is our spirituality? So Jenna was at that point of brokenness and pain, saying, why God, where are you in this? And I began praying for her and, and corresponding with her on Facebook. And the weeks passed, and all of a sudden, I started to see pictures she was posting on Facebook of little 
There were rocks she was finding on the ground, in the dirt, in Haiti, shaped like hearts. Maybe some of you that know the big jewelry with these heart-shaped rocks. Jenna began posting, and the first one she found, for her it brought such comfort and grief, because for her it was an indication that God's love was holding her, even in this place of pain, and even in this place of tragedy, that God's love was there. And every day I would look at my Facebook, and I would see more heart rocks. Jenna was finding them everywhere she went. There were these heart rocks. And I started thinking about that, and I thought, you know, those heart rocks have been buried in the dirt and the soil of Haiti all along. They've been there all along. They didn't just suddenly, miraculously appear. They've been there the whole time. It wasn't until Jenna's own heart had been broken with the pain of others that she had eyes to see beauty in the dirt. That she had eyes to see beauty even in the pain. There is a point at which you and I, when we open our hearts up, what difference does a girl make? Why cry? What good does it do? Because it opens our heart and it opens our soul to a transgressive beauty that's been there all along, that's been waiting for us all along. But there's no other way to experience it or to see it apart from entering that place where the politics is put aside, where we stop engaging in a technology which allows us to view these horrific events almost in this detached, voyeuristic way, and instead we engage with, we weep with those who weep. And in that place, we find a beauty that's been waiting for us. The ancient Greeks tell a story that I love. It's a story called the tear jar. Maybe you've heard of it. But in ancient Greece, it said that they believed that tears were in fact sacred. And so when you, I don't know at what point in time you'd be given this, but at some point in time you would be given a tear jar of your own. And it was just a very tiny, simple clay jar, unadorned, undecorated. And the point at which you contributed your own tears into this tear jar, you were then released to begin to paint on it, decorate it with beautiful, beautiful pictures. So you would have this beautifully adorned tear jar that both held your own tears and that you were able to creatively make beautiful. And it was believed that you could share that with someone else and that those tears, sharing those tears, that that was a sacred gift. This morning, what difference does a girl make? Why cry like a girl? I believe this morning, the message that's on my heart is to have the courage and have the compassion to be willing to go to a place where I'm willing to be broken first and foremost, where I'm willing to be moved to the point of tears, where I can share with someone not answers, not empty cliches, not theological explanations. And this is what I love about the story that we all are familiar with in the New Testament, where it tells the shortest verse in the Bible. If we had kids club here, they would know. What am I talking about? Those of you who are Jesus wept. The shortest verse and perhaps one of the most profound. Because theologically, there was no reason for those tears. It's a theological conundrum. Why did Jesus cry? He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew that this life here and now is not all that there is. That there is a reality of profound mystery and wonder and unconditional love. Why would he be sad? What was the point of those tears? There were tears of transgressive beauty. That story gives me hope. It gives me hope to know that while I may not be able to give us and give myself this nice, neat answer tied up with a bow as to why do these horrible and tragic things happen, it gives me hope to know that I am connected to a God who weeps. 
who cries, who meets me in the middle of my own pain, who's there for me when life doesn't give me any other option and I have no other choice, and who's able to help me to find beauty in the brokenness and the dirt and the muck and the mire. So, in closing this morning, and I could tell you exploits, what difference does a girl make? I could tell you, going back in history, about women like Sojourner Truth. Anybody familiar with that name? One of my great heroes, Sojourner Truth, was a runaway and escaped slave who then went on to free hundreds, if not thousands. And I, I gotta share this one story about Sojourner. Sojourner was illiterate. She was denied the right to an education. And this is a story that's told, don't ask me to back it up, uh, but it's, it's in, not in history books, but if you research it, you will hear the story. Sojourner was running and she was helping some other slaves escape. And she was in the center of the town. She knew they were hot on a trail, slave catchers. She also knew that they had um, wanted posters of her everywhere. And she found herself in a situation, she was in the center of a, of a town and the one of her picture, her picture was plastered everywhere. And she was trying to help these slaves escape. And so in order to not be recognized, she grabbed a book and sat down on a bench and pretended to be reading as the slave catchers walked past her because they'd been told she was illiterate. But she was. A great story. I love that story. What difference does a girl make? I can tell you about a modern day contemporary woman named Layla Bowie, who was instrumental in bringing together a group of Muslim and Christian women for years. They got together and prayed together. Muslim, Christian women, and eventually were instrumental in helping to overthrow and establish the new government. They helped to overthrow Charles Taylor, the Lord. And Michael, my husband and I were watching a documentary uh, about Layla and about this particular story. I will never forget it. Um, and it was a video of, you have to understand, these women had been praying and risking their lives and they get together in a football field dressed all in white because they knew that Charles Taylor's entourage had to go past that particular football field every day on his way to wherever he went. And so they stood together in this field dressed in white, in the sun, in the rain, in the good weather, in the bad weather, in the mud. They joined hands. They sang songs and they prayed. What difference is that going to make? Years later, Taylor's government was about to be toppled and they were bringing together all of the leaders from within that country and they were holding this three day powwow in this luxury hotel. What they were there to do was to determine the next government. And so all these tribal leaders were pulling up and Humvees and Rolls Royces and bodyguards and expensive suits. And Layla and a group of hundreds of women, most of them moms, dressed in white, took buses, walked, went without food to camp out because they knew that what was happening there was not going to affect real change. It was just a switching of power, a switching of terrorists, and they wanted to make a difference. And it was the last day of three days of meetings nothing had happened. And in the documentary, you see some of these women, they were using a borrowed cell phone and they were calling home in tears because many of them did not know if their own children were going to be retaliated against. They were calling home to find out if daughters and sons were dead or alive. There's a price to be paid when we say we're going to journey into the shadow of the valley of someone. And these women paid that price. And the very last piece of this documentary where it seems like all hope is lost. You see Layla, and it shows this, I'll never forget this on the video, and it's a woman who is, you would look at her and say, oh my gosh, she's hysterical, she's out of her mind, because nothing's been accomplished, the women were not being allowed access into these conversations to make a real and effective change for peace, and at that moment in time, Layla lets out a blood-curdling scream. And you have to understand, these warlords knew that international media was focused on them. There were cameras set up, and Layla let out a scream, and she began unwrapping her headdress. And then she began to do this. And at that point, you saw one of the leaders come up to 
contemporary who wasn't speaking English and saying, no, no, no. And when you read her book, her book is called um, Lighting Me Out of Hours. She explains what she was doing. In that culture, the men in that culture believed in women that you brought a curse on yourself and your children if you saw a married woman disrobe. So what she was saying to them is, I am bringing a curse on you. That changed the momentum of that entire meeting that women were then allowed in, the end result was ultimately a female president was put in place in that country. What difference does a girl make? What difference do you and I make when we choose to allow our hearts to go into that place of profound worthiness and profound beauty and come out of that place saying, what is the one thing I can do? So this morning, I want to encourage you and challenge you to know that in your own places of brokenness, there is a beauty and there is a love that is waiting to meet you. And I want to encourage and challenge all of us to weep for those who weep. And to leave this place today determined in purpose to do the one thing that we can do.